All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second TLS session. Um, uh, if you're not here for TLS, um, you should stay anyways. Um, can you go to the next slide? Apparently, this isn't working. Here's a note well. Um, you may have seen this many times so far, so please note it well. Um, uh, do we have a minute taker yeah. for today? Patrick, thank you. Jabber Scribe. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. All right. Um, blue sheets are going around. Please make sure you sign them. Uh, to reiterate, um, in discussing various issues and you know raising comments, uh, please be professional, be polite, be succinct at the microphone, um, and state your name to help the minutes taker and Jabber scribe. Um, uh, uh, so this is our agenda. We're going to start off with a quick update in details 1.3. Some quick bashing to we're going to reorganize and put the uh, return readability check in the connection ID draft uh, after ESNI and then go through a bunch of individual drafts um, that have been brought to the working group for discussion. So um, we went through this earlier this week, so there's no change here. And uh, same. So, all right. Uh, I guess we can just get started with DTS 1.3. There are no slides. Um, to just give everyone a quick update, uh, David Benjamin, some, some very helpful comments and review of the draft, uh, which were incorporated in the latest update uh, from Ecker, um, all of which uh, there's one outstanding issue uh, I believe Ecker wants to quickly comment on. Yeah, so um, I think I got all David's issues. Um, there was like one editorial issue, which somehow I managed to lose and can't find again. But if someone finds it, I'll fix it. It wasn't major. Um, the um, only outstanding technical issue um, um, is uh, that the question of whether we should have to produce key separation between TLS 1.3 and DTLS 1.3. Um, so um, in, to recap, in um, uh, old, uh, um, so um, TLS 1.2 and DTLS 1.2, I believe, do not have key separation because they don't include the transcript and the hashes. Um, um, in Quick, what we did was we did, we did leaf key separation, but not internal key separation, um, so that the internal derivations are, are the same. Um, my, um, um, my intuition is we don't need this for details 1.3 because we hashed the whole transcript, and the transcript will be different, um, because all of the version numbers are not different. The, um, uh, the, the entire handshake messages get marshaled up, and the handshake messages include different headers. Um, so there should, should not be possible to use a DTLS 1.3 transcript for a TLS 1.3 transcript. Um, it's also not entirely clear what the impact of that would be, even if so. Um, even if the leaf key, even if the leaf keys um, were the same, um, it won't be possible to substitute um, pa packets because the data that is integrity checked is different. Um, so my intuition is we don't need to do anything. Um, I can't actually prove that. <laughs> um, um, I'm curious what people think about how they want to resolve it. I think Martin has some thoughts. Um, resolving it would be fairly straightforward. Um, you know, I can imagine a number of ways um, changing the expansion point, changing the initial seed, the initial seed, the initial expansion seed. So um, if people think we ought to do key separation, it's not going to be expensive to do. But um, um, I, I think when we, did, when we did it for quick, there were some, there were some sadness from implementers um, about having to dig that, dig that deep into their key schedule, though that may be different with, with the stack, which is well integrated like DTLS as opposed to quick for TLS. Yeah, so, so Martin Thompson, the concretely the the difference between the two protocols aside from maybe the choice of extensions and all those sorts of other things is the message sequence numbers that we have in the in the handshake messages and and to my knowledge that's really the only thing that we can rely on being different that's cor that's correct because the version numbers are not the same right um i'm not especially concerned about that um i do want to i i do think the property is is important i don't want someone establishing a tls connection on, on the assumption that they have certain properties out of that and then get DTLS guarantees. I think that would be um, not particularly great. Um, but I don't see any anything concretely preventing us from, from relying on the message sequence number stuff. It's, um, uh, doesn't seem that important how it's done. Yeah. Um, if it's, if we are not sure, we can we could easily use the DTLS instead of the TLS string in the key derivation function be be done with it. Yeah, that that would probably be the easiest thing. Um, I I have to count to make sure we're not going to overflow by one, but I think we have enough room. My recollection of the space uh, that we had available was that we had a 
good amount of space, though not a lot. Okay. It's like 13 or something was the limit from memory. Okay. Well, so, so I guess in that, I, I mean, I'm sort of like, I'm tempted to be conservative unless somebody, I guess the reason we didn't do it in quick was because I think a couple people were sad. So unless someone is actually sad about this, my intuition is to be conservative. So I think what I would suggest is, why don't I go count? <laughs> and if we have space, we can just do it. And if we don't have, and if we don't have space, then we can come back and ask. We can choose a different string entirely. Yeah, in, yeah in, in DL, D, DLS one three or something, or just D. Yeah. Um, um, but um, is anybody sad about that? Okay, I'll make that change into a new draft, and I'll do whatever counting. Though um, I think Kazuho and Martin, I'll be asking you to help me count. <laughs> All right. Uh, so then, after that's done, uh, did you have one more comment? I think we're done. Yeah, all right. Um, we have uh, three interoperable implementation, embed, mint, and NSS. Um, so uh, Martin, do you have a comment? Yeah, so um, I raised a comment on the connection ID draft yes. that I think also applies to, to DTLS 1.3. So we should, sorry? That's on the agenda, okay. Yeah. So there is that other technical yes. um, problem that we have to think about. Yeah, and once we work through that, assuming um, no change, we will likely start the working group last call for that again and move forward with it. Um, right, on that note, do ESNI. <laughs>
And if he uh, sends that over to host B, he will get back a server hello that only, or, yeah, a server hello that only supports AS. Uh, therefore, sort of distinguishing um, what host was used when connecting to this particular, or when opening up this particular connection. Um, and this is possible right now because the only thing that we use, we go for one more slide. Um, uh, right, because the only thing that we bind uh, to the ESI key extension is the key share in the client hello and nothing else. Um, and so uh, this simple example kind of illustrates that all, the Cypher Suites must also be bound to the ESNI extension, but it's sort of perhaps not the best thing to, uh, the, be the best approach to sort of patch these in a sort of piecemeal fashion. So go add more and more things as we discover they, they need to be bound. So um, ideally all non-ESI extensions and contents in the client hello must be bound to the ESNI extension. And then we kind of just solve this problem in one fell swoop. Um, that would prevent probing based on modifying any parameters in the client hello because everything is bound to the ESNI extension. Um, and by virtue of including the key share as part of that set, you prevent the uh, cut and paste attacks that are currently prevented. Um, so uh, I think what needs to be done is to find more things to the ESNI extension. Um, next slide, please. Um, but there's also another example. Um, in this case, uh, assume the client hello, same topology setup, server supports, uh, the two hosts support the same type of suite configurations. This uh, client sends a client hello uh, in which he prefers to try over ES and the adversary does absolutely nothing. He simply just forwards them to two different hosts and gets a response back. Um, he can then distinguish what uh, the SNI value was based on if prior knowledge of what the CypherSuite supported, so where CypherSuite are for those particular hosts. Um, next slide, please. There's really nothing we can do about this. Uh, a server anonymity set, in quotes, is configured in this particular way. Um, we can't stop an adversary from doing this sort of probing without modifying any of the client hello contents. Um, so ideally, servers that are in the same anonymity set respond to client hello messages um, the same way for every non-ESNI piece of the message. Yeah, Eric. Uh, Chris, I'm not sure I'm following this. Can you scroll back one slide? Uh... Sorry, so what is the relationship between these two servers? They're different origins? Sorry, different origins? They're different origins. I, I'm not assuming any. I'm just assuming that they're it's supposedly in the same anonymity set. Right. But why is it, why is it, is this assuming you're not binding in all the, but you're assuming you are binding in all the properties, right? Yes. Right, okay. So the so, adversary doesn't change anything in the client hello. He just simply forwards them. But I guess my point is, one of them shouldn't be answering, right? Sorry? One of them should, be, one of them, I mean, one of them, only one of them matches the SNI. Yes. So why is the other one answering at all? Uh, yeah, perhaps it's a Greece extension, um, or it's a Greece DSNI value, but I guess in that case, yeah, perhaps you're right. Um, Want to go to fallback? If they're purportedly in the same anonymity set, do you get the fallback? Yes. I mean, I mean, I mean, there, there's a there's a basic problem that I think that that I mean, that certainly is correct, which is that, um, that, that but, but I mean, so I think David and Ben and I were talking about this last. I don't, I'm not sure if I see him here, but um, that you know, um, it's certainly the case that just by watching, you can just by watching how the server responds, you can learn whether it's A or B because you learn whether it chooses GCM or Poly 1305. So like, uh, judge of Poly. So I mean, like, as a practical matter, they have to for, for these cipher speed attacks, they have to behave identically. Or you're just like your host. I mean, that, I, I mean, like probing aside observationally, if I just if I look, if I have the connection go through, I can look at which one it chooses. Um, right. So I think so. I think like observationally, you have to behave identically in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, and, and to Martin's point, you should fall back. So perhaps this is not the correct example, but the the underlying point is the same. Yes. Yeah. Martin, Martin Thompson, can you go forward a slide, please? Um, oh no no, it was your it was the yeah the the anonymity set the partitioning forward, slide forward. that had the potential solution here. Um, I think what you really want to say here is that um, servers must produce um, similar choices for its server hello extensions and uh, server hello um, rather than having completely identical responses across everything. Because once we're past the server hello, 
everything everything's encrypted. So if you have an extension that's responded to in encrypted extensions, it, you are allowed to make different choices at that point. It's your, um, I guess, the, your cryptographic configuration that needs to be consistent across all of those um, things in the same way. Yeah, I think that's, that's more crisp and correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Rich? Yeah, yeah Rich Solzakma. Yeah, I was, yes, to what Martin said. I had, I had assumed that it was always going, that that was sort of implied by the doc. Um, Therefore, it's not currently stated, so we should probably explicitly state yes. that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, make it explicit and point out the dangers of what happens if you don't do it. Martin, could you open an issue perhaps for that? That would be great. Um, right, so uh, moving on. So this is the, uh, the more interesting attack that came up in discussions with Eric and David and Stephen. Um, and it basically works like so, uh, and this is assuming the current draft. Client sends a client hello with ESNI valid ESNI not agrees extension to a particular host um, who sends back an HRR. Um, the on path adversary then, uh, by virtue of responding to an HRR, swaps in its own key share, swaps in its own ESNI encryption of uh, encrypted SNI value of whatever, and then sends it to complete the connection uh, to the server. Uh, if the server doesn't check that the SNI value that's in the second client hello matches that of the first, or rather checks that the inner contents of the ESNI extension match that of the first client hello, uh, perhaps because he's made a determination based on what SNI to use uh, from the first client hello, uh, then the server will happily complete the connection, sending the certificate and corresponding SNI value, uh, which is selected based off the SNI value from the first client hello. So the adversary can just finish the handshake and look at the certificate to figure out exactly what SNI or, or probable SNI was used to complete the connection. Um, this is not great. Um, so moving forward. Uh, so ideally what we want is the server, we want to require the servers to do this check. Um, uh, and we can say in text, you know, the servers must absolutely check that the contents of the first ESNI extension match that of the second otherwise fall back to the, the public name or do something. Um, uh, but this is not really a cryptographic check in any particular way. Um, and it's also prone to implementation mistakes uh, or servers, you know, people implementing servers just choosing to, you know, skip over that part of the text, um, in which case a client is still kind of in a bad position. Um, so ideally this would be uh, achieved somewhat cryptographically. Um, and the proposal, uh, Actually, if you just go forward, um, the proposal is to, uh, or a proposal rather, um, I'm open to suggestions as uh, we're all open to suggestions, uh, to include something from the ESNI extension in the key schedule. Um, uh, that has the um, uh, that has the effect of effectively binding that ESNI extension from the first client hello to the duration of for the rest of the handshake effectively. Um, and I realize that um, people may react negatively to putting things in the key schedule, uh, but I think of all the options that gives us the guarantees that we want in a pretty um, intuitive way. So, I mean, of course, subject to formal analysis from our friends. Yeah, Martin. So Martin Thompson, to be clear here, this is, this is uh, us making it impossible to do the wrong thing rather yes. than simply leaving that up to implementations and so at servers to do that on their own discretion. And there's a number of ways in which people might take information from the first client hello and try to save effort in processing the second one. And because this is a pretty significant cost in terms of processing, um, I can see how that, that might be the case. Yeah. Particularly when you're talking about using the ESNI extension to route on that first client hello, so you kind of need it on the first one. There's a, there's a strong temptation there. Yeah, exactly. I don't um, have a strong opinion on w what we do here, but um, changes to the key schedule are awkward, but doable. So. Yeah, um, awkward for a number of reasons. Like where, in which direction does it go into the key schedule? Um, how do you, like, does it come in as a PSK? But what, what do you do then if you're resuming a session that has a PSK or put it in an ECDH key share. And what if you want to do another thing that happens to modify the key schedule, which will be discussed later. Um, 
Yeah. So the the um, the the post quantum hybrid stuff. Yeah. The draft that Douglas has is is actually really good sort of formulation of of how we sort of think about these sorts of problems. And I, I sort of wonder whether we we need to think about this more concretely in in, in the abstract a little bit before we start tackling Absolutely. these sorts of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it seems like we should probably separate out two questions. Uh, one, what is the general strategy which to follow here? And the second is, what are the specific mechanics of how it's done? In particular, as Martin suggests, if we're getting to the point where we think we're going to do a lot, a lot of key schedule additions, then it's probably worth cooking up some mechanism for doing that generally that, uh, that, that allows arbitrary insertions at each point. Um, I, I'm not going to say I regret not allowing that before. Uh, life was complicated enough, but probably some, a problem to solve now. Uh, the thing I'd like to understand that I don't think I understand yet is what the sufficiency set is for things that are going to solve this problem. Namely, the sufficiency set. Namely, is it enough to just have something in the key schedule? Do we also have to do a, a, a digest, a, a, you know, a binding across the client hello? Uh, I think we're getting complicated enough now that we're going to need some formal analysis to reason about it. Uh, we, you know, we had some initial puts on this, but that's so it seems like the next step probably rather than discussing exactly what to do here um, is to sort of leave this as an open question and for input and then let the and then, and then have a small group of people go off and like interface with you know Karthik Bhargavan and Kaz and like have them help us work through the problems um, but I, I think you know getting getting new ideas is like fantastic and because a new idea is great but trying to decide which one is to do now seems like not very practical we can only get out information for that yeah, I mean, we could even form like a, a design team of force to go off and focus on this particular problem. Um, the current thinking now is to do both the binding and the key schedule search because it seems like to be the most conservative and kind of intuitively you want to include everything um, in the client hello into the ESNI extension. Um, but uh, of course, subject to change based on analysis and outcome from discussions with our friends. So I don't know which of you was first. I believe it was me. Um, Jonathan Hoyland, Cloudflare. Um, so I'm currently trying to write a draft on how to inject stuff into the TLS key schedule without breaking all the formal proofs um, with Chris. So uh, that is definitely something that we should probably do. But just as a question on this, could you comment on why this can't be done in exactly the same style as the PSK binder? So you just include the same stuff as the PSK binders would have included? Uh, you mean have the ESNI extension be the penultimate extension in the client hello just before the PSK binder? Well, I wouldn't define it like that. I would just say the truncate client hello doesn't include things that say they aren't included. And all of the ones that aren't included must go at the end because you know you can't do cyclic hashing. So yeah. Um, that is one of the options, yes. Um, I guess the, the a, a, issue with that is that um, if we have to do this again for whatever reason, then are we going to start just stacking up extensions on the bottom of the client hello? Um, and what about the ordering for these things? And it it becomes <coughs> tricky. And, and there are other proposals as well to do the binding. I'm not, I'm not proposing a specific solution right now. I'm just saying that perhaps we should do that. We should do the, the full binding. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the reasons why I'm trying to define the layering thing. Christian, Christian Wittemar. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I see this business of uh, incorporating all ESNI, all client hello extension in the ESNI, you know, I just went through the motions of uh, updating Kazuo's code from uh, the draft 02 to the draft 03. And there are some code paths that become really, really shitty if you have to go to all the extensions, because effectively, you, you get a, a variation of who's on top. And and if we have to solve the who's on top of like, oh, I'm the SNI extension, I'm on top. But no, I'm the PSK extension, I'm on top. Oh, it's, that kind of stuff is not healthy. I, I, yes, I would agree. Um, so so I, 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 I would very much like to say that whatever secret we treat, we inject that secret somehow to make a binding, but we, we don't require all these chaining of extension and interdependencies because it makes the code very fragile. To be clear, are you suggesting that we don't need to bind to things like the Cypher Suites beyond the key share? I don't know that we need to bind 
none of them or just one of them. But I would say that a requirement to bind all of them results in code that is terrible to maintain. Sure. Um, I, we're just this proposal is trying to take the conservative approach where we might, you know, say we minted this RFC just and the only thing we included was the key share in the service suites, and we discover, oh shoot, there's this other parameter that could possibly be unbounded and used to break the SNI. Um, we just we're, it'd be best if we could avoid that situation and doing everything does so, so it. basically I like the fact that I mean if we somehow inject the result of the secret into the handshake key then we are guaranteed that an attacker will not decrypt the handshake the the included handshake and then we are only concerned with what leaks in the clear text server hello and that becomes a much more tractable solution um, not quite fine, but perhaps we can talk offline. Okay. Uh, I think Becker, you were next. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, yeah, I, I think the message here is clear. We went through a couple of cycles of this, and clearly we're not, we're not we don't have the tools yet to reason about it. Um, so I think what I'm interested in doing, as I indicated earlier, is getting the tools to reason about it. So I'm perfectly happy to have a belt and suspenders approach in which we have several things, and that may in fact be valuable for other reasons as we've discussed. Um, but what I'd like to understand is what every individual component we're adding is doing and which attacks is stopping so that we have a complete model of the attack picture. Because it seems like what happened here, uh, and, and you know, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not naming anybody because I was involved with this as anybody else, but what happened here is we had a partial attack model and so we closed the attacks we knew about, but then we didn't have a way of reasoning about all possible attacks. So I'd like to get to the point where we can reason all possible attacks so that we know we were doing the right thing. And then if we need belt and suspenders, um, then fine, or if we determine the bottom spinners is good, also fine. But I just want to make sure I understand what everything is doing and how they hold together. Yeah, correct. Thank you. Jonathan? Um, yeah, there, there is some research on exactly what you would need to include in these scenarios uh, by Kartik, so we should ask him. Oh, absolutely. He's on our list. <laughs> um, 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's move to the next issue. I actually, quickly go back. I'm sorry. Um, so. Uh, the, the issues that I just described um, led to these three questions. Um, uh, the first of which I think is a, we have a very clear answer for. Do we require that servers are in the same on that sort of behave identically? Um, yes. Uh, I think unless anyone objects to that, um, you know, speak now for everyone Um so We discussed uh, the binding issue. Um, so perhaps continue that uh, in the smaller team or on the list or whatever. Um, uh, and then, uh, relatedly, we'll work on how we do the um, binding of the first and second client hello in the HRR case. Yeah, Kyle. Uh, Kyle Eckritz. Um, I think if we make the uh, <clears throat> number one an absolute requirement, um, that in the most sense pre prevents any changes in a um, distributed system at all. Um, so I, I think we should make sure we um, know the implications of exactly that like absolute requirement yeah so I, by require i don't mean like put a must in there like the servers must do this but like they should do this and if they don't here's what here's what can happen uh nick sullivan cloth i think yeah question number one does complicate the deployment pretty yep. significantly and uh i would not be in favor of requiring that um it, it's different if you even if you're using a single proxy uh, various web websites or domains will have different configurations for different reasons, and uh, forcing them to to conform to the same cipher suite set is is not necessarily um, going to work. I, I I would like this the anonymity set to encompass uh, as many uh, domains as possible, rather than um, uh, singling out the ones that have special requirements. Yeah, I suspect this is mostly just a, a text editorial issue. Um, I, I think we're in agreement that, like, yes, uh, ideally, servers that have similar configurations are, th there's many servers in the same anonymous set that have this particular configuration, not like all the servers that are under control of a particular operator look ex shaped exactly the same way. But yeah, Sabod. Sabod Angar. Um, irrespective of ESNI, it seems kind of undesirable to have the uh, entity generating the HRR client hello be able to be different from the entity generating the original client hello in the first place in TLS. Um, maybe it's a more general problem than just ESNI fix it for TLS itself, where we can guarantee that the entity generating the 
new client hello during the HRR is the same as the entity to generate the original client hello in the first place. Sorry, are you are you asking? Um, are you saying we, we need a mechanism to yeah, uh, be able I, I to mean, prove that the, the the client who sends the second client hello is the one that sent the first one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, there's nothing specific to ESNI here. Um, right. Uh, it's just that ESNI exposes this thing because, like, we don't get the privacy properties out of this because there's a I wouldn't say a flaw, but <laughs> unanalyzed case in uh, TLS in such a way. And so we expected to get these privacy properties, but we didn't get these privacy properties. Can we fix TLS uh, 1.3 to such that we'll get these privacy properties back from the TLS protocol itself? We don't need these hacks for ESNI, but it'll just work generally for any other extension that we add in the future. Yeah, very good point. Um, I think I'm next. So on this question one, um, certainly we can, it's possible to not require the all servers in the same anonymity to behave identically. But uh, probe, this was the point of the comment I was making earlier, that definitely does leak information. Uh, because the way to think about this is, imagine that you have an enemy set of, of K servers, and K minus one servers all prefer AES GCM, and the K, and, and the K server, um, and, and, and the other remaining server prefers Cha Cha Poly. So all I have to do is look, watch the transactions, and if the transaction comes through and it's Cha Cha Poly, I know it must be the K, that K minus one server. And so like, that's not a probing attack, that's an observational attack. And so like, as David Benjamin pointed out, that's not as good as a probing attack, but it's certainly a plausible attack. Uh, and so to the extent to which it's, to, to the extent to which servers um, don't, you know, don't have the enemy set identically, they're partitioning the enemy set in some ways, and there's not really much to do about that. And we're trying to live with that, I think. Um, and the advice ought to be, do the best you can, have like uniform configuration, and you know, ESNI is not a, is not going to be a perfect defense. It's a partial defense, and but the, the advice is that is what just the anonymity set in those sort of circumstances. Thank you, Martin. Can you? Martin tells me I was going to say the same thing. So that's fine. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ben Kadek. You know, I had been thinking similar things to what Subod was thinking about. You know, is this a, a more general question? And I think we did briefly consider this when we were writing TLS one three, and we concluded that we didn't want to make the server have to do the work all the time to keep the state. Uh, because it didn't matter that much. And it may just be that the conclusion here is if you're going to do ESNI as the server, you have to do more work. Seems reasonable. Uh, yeah. Rich Stalls, Akamai, just on the server side to echo what the browser side said, yeah, they, if they're not looking the same, then you can partition them operationally. So don't do that. Yep. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Eric Nago and Akamai, and plus one to what Nick was saying, if we especially in question one, if we can provide guidance, but if we start trying to enforce things too much, it'll just require lots of frag. It may be, mean that people operationally just start splitting things down and defeat the purpose. Cool, thank you. Kyle McRitz, as far as the question of um, this being a more generic problem, I think one thing that's special about this is that we do have, to, <clears throat> we do have the potential to um, use some kind of a shared secret with the uh, client key share, um, whereas most extensions, um, we do not have that. And usually we're sending a um, HRR in response to not having an acceptable key share in the first place. So I think this would be a little bit more difficult problem to solve generically. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Can you move to the next slide? Um, all right. So uh, we'll continue that discussion on the issues and uh, in the issues and on the list. Uh, the next big one is uh, HPKE and whether or not ESNI should adopt it. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, uh, HPKE is hybrid public key encryption, basically ECIS, but uh, with CHEMS and DEMS. Um, uh, the contract for HPKE is that you generate, whenever you encrypt to a public key, you generate a new fresh key share effectively at for each encryption. Um, and there's a cipher suite that says exactly what algorithm you use for doing that encryption algorithm. Uh, in ESNI currently, we basically do um, ECIS um, with Diffie-Hellman, uh, and we reuse the key share currently, um, meaning that uh, in, upon getting an HRR, you would send the same client uh, ESNI key share that you sent in the first one. Um, and the cipher suite used to negotiate which particular algorithms for ECIS is sent uh, using, uh, sent in the ESNI key share using the TLS cipher suite um, spec. Forward. Um, so the benefits of HP adoption here um, are that we don't roll our own crypto uh, and we use something that the CFRG sort of blessed in a way. Um, the drawbacks uh, beyond it being an active draft currently uh, and still um, under, act, uh, under construction and still um, 
you know, in need of analysis, are that uh, by changing the uh, ESNI key share effectively on HRR, you are forcing the server to do another public key operation. Uh, in processing that, that might be a deal breaker. Um, I'm not sure. Um, so, I mean, there may be other benefits and drawbacks as well. Uh, perhaps, Martin, you want to raise one. Yeah, Martin Thompson, the, the size of the packet is starting to get pretty big. And um, so you, if you have to put two separate key shares in, you've expanded the, the, the um, usage space. And we have primitives, but the, the flip side of that is that we have primitives that um, reuse of a key share doesn't work for. Um, and so we need to be aware of that. So we were looking at SIDH, for instance, and you can't reuse a key share in that context. Sorry, um, the ESNI key share is already separate from the client hello key share used for handshake. Oh, right, sorry. Um, but yes, there's also the issue you're mentioning about. Right. If we were to go back, there would be that issue. Yeah, David Benjamin. Uh, David Benjamin. <laughs> um, so uh, I think it might make sense to look at this after we've sorted, sorted out all the like binding stuff because that might change the things we want out of our crypto box thingy. Um, for instance, I don't know if HPK lets us derive some like random extra key to stick in the key schedule. And so if we decide we want to do that, then this might constrain us. So I would suggest we like make this decision last. Very good point. I agree with David's position with a slight friendly amendment, which is let's sort out what we need. And if it's close enough to HP key, but not exactly HP key, let's call CFRG and tell them to change it. I think Richard is in the room, hopefully. And um, I'm sure he'd be willing to change it. So, so in for instance, we wanted, you know, and you know, I don't know what you would call it, but HP key plus ancillary random output, like that seems like pretty easy to generate. So uh, presumably like let's, you know, the purpose of the, of the work in, you know, CFRG is partly to support the work here, so. All right, yeah, um, that's uh, certainly an approach as well. Um, we have one more issue. Um, we have one more important issue. Hopefully we can get through this really quickly. Um, uh, and that is of split mode. Uh, currently the drafts uh, supports both shared and split mode. Um, in the split mode case, uh, basically the, the client facing server has to send some secret key material to the backend server. Um, right now we suggest basically doing that by sending it prepended to the client hello on the TCP connection, encrypted under a symmetric key that the two uh, endpoints happen to share. Um, and you might want this for some use cases. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so uh, benefits, uh, there may be use cases that require this. Uh, drawbacks, of course, that uh, this does add complexity to the document. Um, and it, depending on uh, one's perspective, it, it might uh, constrain the things that we could possibly encrypt. You might imagine in shared mode, um, and ESNI with only shared mode, you could potentially encrypt more than just the uh, SNI, like ALPN, et cetera. Um, it's also potentially part of a more general protocol that uh, Ben will be talking about in a little bit. Uh, so I posed the question to the group, um, should we include it, uh, to what extent, um, or drop it? Eric Chris Squirrel again. The document doesn't really include it or not include it. It just says this is consistent with its operational mode and then it has some hand waving about how you'd implement it. Um, uh, so I'm not quite clear on what complexity is being, uh, is being added here. If we get to the point where including it, we're having a document which is compatible, like I see it as a requirement rather than as a function in this, in this protocol, maybe to be requirement to be compatible with the split mode. If it turns out that that requirement is like causing us a lot of pain, we can revisit it. But until then, I'd like to have the requirement continue written down so that we remember it because I think it is an important use case. Yeah, maybe we can't get them all, but like, let's not, let's not like shorten our sites until we know we have to. Would you, uh, just quickly, assuming like, the, the proposal that Ben came up with was fine. Would you be okay like referencing that instead of describing sort of um, the, the, the thing we have currently? Well, I mean, it, it, if you mean the thing we have currently, you mean the ridiculous hand waving at the bottom about how to like send the... Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that part is fine. But I think that it's important to have the prefatory material that says like it's supposed to work this way so that people remember how this is supposed to function so that as we work on the document, then we don't screw up. Great, okay. Yeah, this is Daniel Khan Gilmore. So I definitely think this is an important requirement for this case. There are going to be people uh, who want to operate um, a protected server in the back end that can't share the content with the front end server. So yes, please make sure that this stays as a requirement. Great. 
Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Bart. Yeah, agreeing with Ecker and uh, DKG. Also, there might be more than one way of doing the back end of the split mode in future. So I think we keep the requirement. I'm not sure we want to normatively say, here's the one and only, one true way of doing it in this document. That's fine with me. Yeah. Um, so we can update the text accordingly, uh, just maintaining the requirement and then describing potentially one might, one might go about doing this. Um, and I don't think we have any time for the rest of it. Um, th so uh, please take a look at the issues. Um, uh, they're on the GitHub page or on the GitHub repo uh, comment. Uh, I will try to summarize the, what are the big open questions that send to the list, encouraging people to comment. Um, and regarding the earlier, uh, more non-trivial changes, uh, I guess we'll, if anyone's interested in working on this particular problem, we can get together um, with our formal analysis friends and kind of crack through it. So Christian raised his hand and I'm sure the other people who we've been talking about will be interested as well. So um, I think that's it, unless there are any other questions. Great, thanks. Connection ID. It doesn't work. I try to be brief. Um, uh, so the connection ID topic. Uh, so there are, at the moment, three documents I would like to talk about. Um, the first two on the top are the uh, connection ID for the DTLS 1.2, uh, the connection ID for the 1.3, which is in the uh, DTLS 1.3 specification itself. And then uh, there's a new document on the bottom, um, and I will get to that in a, in a minute. Next slide. So this is the um, the regular behavior. So you, if you remember, and I'm not going to repeat the, the use of the connection ID again, but um, we had regular client IoT device talking to a server via NAT, and the NAT obviously changes um, the IP address, source IP address, and, and the port as well, typically. And so you have the connection ID in the payload, which associates uh, the um, or links to the keys and the algorithms. So everything good so far, the NAT makes these modifications and um, that's exactly the intended behavior. Next slide. Um, unfortunately, late in the, in the process, we found out that we, we missed um, an important security consideration. It's really a shame actually, because uh, uh, some of us worked on this in the mobility space beforehand, so you, we should have actually noticed it, but uh, blanked out on that. So here's the case, imagine that there's an on-path adversary who is kind of like a gnat, um, but is able obviously uh, to change the source board of the packets that pass through. And so he changes it to um, redirect the traffic to some remote server. And it, in case there is an asymmetry between the traffic that goes from, in this case, the client um, to then finally the, uh, the victim, then this adversary is able to uh, make an amplification attack. That's obviously a problem. Uh, what I didn't describe in the slide is the case where there's an off pass adversary who injects some packets, um, but thanks to, so like obviously the properties of DTLS with uh, authenticated packets, um, that's not possible because the attacker can't mint the packets with the correct key to make them uh, pass through the security checks. And um, so you wouldn't update uh, the, the binding in your uh, database to send the return traffic to this newly uh, indicated IP address without actually checking uh, the, the cryptographic parts of the packet. Martin. So just a small amendment here. The adversary does not necessarily need to be um, directly on path. They can be an observer that is able That's to the next receive slide. the packets. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, going to the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, this is this case. Um, so we'll talk about this one that you just raised, Martin. Um, you see the slight shift of the box uh, in my uh, great uh, drawing skills, so the, as Martin said, the, um, the attacker doesn't need to be on path, so he's not, he sees traffic flowing by, but he can't modify it. Um, but what it does here is, what this um, color coding is supposed to indicate, 
he basically, after the packets from the client to the server pass through, um, the adversary replays a packet but changes um, the source and an IP address and port. And as a consequence, if the server doesn't check for that replay, he would send the traffic to, um, again, to the victim. So the other observation here is that um, routing on the internet is not always ideal. And so you might end up with, in a situation where the adversary has a faster path and can they, they can copy a packet and replay it uh, and beat the real packet to the server. Um, it's, a, it's a race condition thing. But um, you're also able to, to mount the same attack without relying on the anti-replay properties that the yeah. server might be implementing. Yeah. So in some sense, um, we don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to enable the anti-replay protection, which DTLS uh, offers. Um, you could uh, rely on a newly defined rule, which we haven't added to the document yet. Uh, it's in a GitHub repository as text, but uh, needs some discussion on that the server needs to, before sending it to this new IP address, he would actually have to check whether this is indeed the newer packet uh, in terms of the sequence number and so on, even if the uh, replay protection is disabled. That would be one possibility to deal with uh, with this case. So that, that would only deal with the case where the, the an old packet was, was copied. It right. wouldn't deal with the case where a, a, a live packet was raced to the server. True. Um, if you go back to one slide, um, of course, there's also the possibility not to basically black hole traffic, uh, which is sort of what this figure is supposed to indicate. Um, needless to say that if there's an adversary on, along the path, he can as well just uh, drop packets um, without having to reroute them unnecessarily. Uh, that's also a possibility. Um, so what I'm trying to get to here is that we have updated the DTLS 1.2 connection ID draft with some text to describe those uh, threats and also um, the DTLS 1.3 specification to include the discussion of those. Um, what, and that's, um, if you go back to the second slide, there is there is a new um, document out there that provides a DTLS-based return routability check, uh, which is this document at the bottom. Um, there is, of course, also the possibility to expose these address changes up to the application layer protocol via the DLS uh, or DTLS-specific API and let the application uh, deal with it. That's possible as well. In some cases, um, for, depending on what type of application traffic you have, these issues that I just talked about may not be um, as severe as they look like because, for example, in co-op, you typically don't have, or you don't have this one message to the server and then a huge amount of messages um, going back because of the stop and wait um, nature of the, of the protocol. It has a congestion window of one. Um, so, so that's not there, but in a generic case, one could imagine that um, DTLS is also used to secure traffic where you have a high asymmetry and then making use of those return routability checks specifically provided at the DTLS layer makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so Martin Thompson, the, the other thing to observe here is, um, and I've got to credit Eric here, who's sitting over there. Eric Kinnear uh, has done a lot of analysis on this thing for, for quick. And there are, there are a couple of other cases that you might want to consider in your, in your threat model, depending on, on the decision you make. There's a good write-up now. It's, it's, a, it's in a pull request on the quick specification. I can send a link to that to the, to the mailing list. Um, the return readability check that you described does not necessarily cover all of these cases adequately, unfortunately. And so there's, a, there's logic that you need to apply in, in both, both endpoints, in fact, in order to make sure that you're not subject to, to attack. So um, I would encourage you to read what we've done in quick and read Eric's analysis of that. And um, I would suggest that you copy that design. Let's not do this twice. Yeah, we, we obviously looked at the uh, quick text and uh, that's a good idea. And that's also why uh, we decided to have a separate document on this because um, it can advance independently of the other stuff for those cases where 
that type of uh, concern is um, is big enough to warrant a return routability check procedure. And I think um, it makes sense to have something at the DTLS layer very much like uh, you guys did in Quick. Eric Criscola, so I think there's two questions here, one of technology and one of, perhaps three, one of layering and one of document structure. So the when we decided to add the connection ID details 1.3, the general concept was that we we're going to add the machinery that you would need to do the connection ID because those had to live at the transport layer. But then any of the machinery you needed to handle the changes in connection, changes in IP address, we put somewhere else. And I think that this existence of this RRC document is a good example of why that's a good design decision because it means that we can worry about the migration case while continuing to let the base protocol advance. And this is the same, the same decision we roughly made for, for details 1.2. So what I think we, here's what I propose we do, um, both for technical reasons and also for expedience reasons. Uh, I propose that we say in the two up two drafts up top of this, the CID draft, the, the CID draft, the 1.3 draft, here's the machinery for connection ID and DTLS shouldn't automatically do any kind of response to this. It should just accept the packets as it is and should, and should not adjust the, the, the peer address. And then it should say, um, here are some considerations about what you would generally need to do in order to adjust the peer address. And, um, and the, but it's the responsibility of the application or some future extension like the RRC draft to tell you how to actually do that. And that lets us advance the wire format mechanics um, for people who need them and then, um, and then, then co-refine the return reliability check really quick and get, and get the right answer. So that's how I propose we actually get. Uh, I, I'm, I would, yes. Sorry, my question was whether that meant that the PR number 70 on the CID draft goes away. We'll have to refine it a little bit, but I think, um, I think, no, I think, I think it needs to duplicate the text that's in, duplicate the text that's in one, well, we need to take the text that's in one point, in 1 1.3 and the PR number 70, mm -hmm. harmonize them and then lay them in both places. Um, and they're roughly correct, but I think that the the thing that is in 70 that is not in the 1.31 is a little bit of discussion about the general kinds of conditions under which it, under which it would be safe to, you know, maybe do, maybe do a fast response um, and also a prohibition on the a clear prohibition on the DTLS stack doing it itself. Yeah, it would be nice if we have the same text um, in 1.3 and 1.2. Currently, there's different text in in those two documents. I think it would be nice to harmonize them. So. Um, you two are going to work on that on a plane somewhere? <laughs> we book some separate flights for this. You're, you're on the trail. You guys are going to run for a long time, and you can talk it out. It'll be great. Uh, Eric Kinnear, Apple. So uh, one, hi, and we should definitely talk. That would be great. Um, looking at some of the attacks, I think one of the pieces that is most interesting here is the han how you handle when you notice that you're receiving duplicate packets um, that potentially share a connection ID or, or not, um, where some adversary in the middle that's observing your packets is racing them. Because uh, I think that's one of our only identified paths towards kind of um, being a little bit more resilient to that kind of attack. Uh, and it, it seems like there's a little bit better chance to harness some of that here than there is in Quick. So I'd be interested in chatting more about that offline and seeing if we can kind of merge some of those things together. Hey, Martin, let's keep it quick. Yeah. Martin Thompson, I think you want to move all of the migration pieces into this doc, into this RRC draft and actually talk about that as a migration document based on, based on Neca's suggestion. Wonderful. We have our marching orders. Thanks. Quick, thanks. All right, compact TLS. So this is by way of an informational presentation more than anything else, um, and um, information two ways, I suppose, to tell you about it and get people's feedback. Um, the um, context here is, well, that there's been um, increased interest in having an ache um, which has um, smaller messages, or is generally smaller. Um, this uh, is initially prompted by some of the work 
um, in Lake um, for the for the need for IoT to have compact uh, uh, key exchange. Um, I take this off. Next. So, um, so the question is like, you want a compact um, key exchange? Like, what do you do? So we spent like an enormous amount of time on one three getting it right, or at least as right as we know how to get. Um, it's got a community wide study. We have all these papers. We have like a lot of implementations. It's already a pretty large fraction of traffic from browsers, and we're seeing increased deployment in other places as well. Uh, it's like a fully general protocol, or at least maybe too general, and we're already seeing a lot of extension points, like you're seeing subserts and, and maybe it's RRC staying and ESNI. But like what it really isn't is not super compact. The uh, original design wasn't that compact, and we didn't like really make much effort to make it more compact. There are a few places where we try to shrink things down, but generally this was not a design goal, in large part because so many of the applications of TLS involve certificates, and the certificates are so large that basically they dominate the size of the packets. Next slide. Um, so there, but it's turning out that there are other applications where people would like to have a much smaller, uh, much more transcript. Uh, first of all, well, not transcript, actually, I should say, a much more wire image. Uh, this is, as I say, initially prompted by some work on IoT, but also we separately had conversations in Quick about how big, like, the Quick messages are and how nice it would be if we could get them a little smaller, especially in the client hello, where we're, narrow, we're narrowly restrained at the first 1,200 bytes. Um, unless you want to have some sort of extra machinery, as David Benjamin has pointed out. So there are two general approaches to fixing this or addressing this. One is to keep the protocol general, but just like try to cut out all the gratuitous encoding overhead. So TLS is full of gratuitous encoding overhead. A very common idiom will be to have some data, data block which has length defined and then have it be a vector of things which has a length in front of that. And so now you have the length of the thing and you have the length of the vector and like those are completely duplicative, but they're still there. And it's, it's especially, this is actually a real source of, de of engineering defects, by the way, where you'll like write, um, you'll forget the external length, you have like the external length field and you forget the internal length field and you have interrupt problems. I've made this mistake a number of times. I'm sure other people have as well. Um, so you can remove all the redundant length fields. There's also lots of places where we have like fixed length length fields for things which are almost never as big as the ostensibly you're supposed to be. So a really common pattern will be like handshake messages can be up to two to 24 bytes long. I don't think I've ever seen a two to 24 byte handshake message unless someone de deliberately made it that long uh, by like adding a bazillion certificates. So I think Barnes and I may pathologically made one one day on the plane, but generally this doesn't happen. But nevertheless, you're always consuming three bytes for the length of the, of the handshake message all the time. So this is a gratuitous and it's, again, this wasn't a big deal when like, when we did 1.3 uh, because there's, like, there's plenty of room, but if you want things to be small, it's gratuitous. And so we have variable, it's possible to replace those with variable length integers and things get smaller. There's also a number of places where you have uh, values which you could say were explicit or were explicit where they might be implicit. So a good example here is that if you only support one, uh, one elliptic curve type, then why are you bothering to say, here are the curve types of support and here are the key shares that go with it? So you can imagine saying, look, I just gave you the key shares and I'm not gonna take any others, so don't bother like bothering me with an HRR. Um, there's also some places where it looks like there's some excessively long crypto variables. The random is a good example. It's not really clear we need a 32 octet random. Um, now, of course, we are like chewing up a bunch of, like, we're increasingly using up that space for various kinds of sentinel values, so it's not clear how much room we actually have left, but it does seem like these limits. Um, there's also some questions about whether or not um, we can make finish shorter, because finish is quite long. So this is effectively just like TLS 1.3 with a better encoding. And uh, and, it's, and so you basically get an isomorphism between 1.3 and, um, uh, and and CTLS, and it's pretty easy to convince yourself that those are the same protocol. And if you look at all the analysis work in the proofs, all those all the analysis work was basically done without really looking at the wire encoding in detail anyway, and so certainly doesn't pay much attention to, for instance, how long the length fields are. Uh, so that's like strategy one. Um, strategy two, uh, which was suggested by Karthik Bhargavan, is to sort of go the other direction and say, let us like remove generality and instead basically have a compression layer that takes sort of your fully general TLS protocol and then compresses into a reduced version that goes in the wire. Um, and so you probably want some kind of um, explicit or implicit shape parameter that told you what that, what that compression was supposed to look like. And then what you end up with is a very small wire transcript. But what you probably want to do is then re-decompress that into like a full TLS transcript that you feed into everything. And so you think of it as basically a compression layer between those two. Um, this is, I, I think, has a nice property. Yes. Hi, um, I'm a native English, English speaker, but I'm struggling to follow you at your pace. Would you mind slowing down your speech a little? <laughs> No. Sure. Please, thank you. Right. Would people like me to restart this slide or should I just continue? 
Um, so as I say, um, the, you probably would want to take the transcript and then re-expand it back into the full TLS transcript. So basically what you have is TLS 1.3 for all the key schedule, et cetera. Um, this also has the advantage that then all the things that you were essentially compressing down get be re, get like re, uh, rematerialized back into the transcript so you know the negotiation was correct. Um, this probably this may or may not require some kind of cross protocol defense to avoid having CTLS talk to TLS 1.3. Um, you could think of that as a feature or a bug, depending on your perspective. So that's why I say you may, may or may not want that. Um, either approach has like the reasonable chance of keeping the existing proofs valid, which is the main thing we're trying to do. That that the the, uh, uh, the the main theme here, right, is we have a protocol which is spending enormous time. We spend a lot of time engineering. And we spend, spend a lot more time engineering adding things to, and we'd like to continue getting value out of that while still having a compact um, protocol, rather than having to have a separate line of compact protocols that then have to incrementally be, in, be extended in all the same ways that we're extending TLS. Uh, to give you a concrete example of this, uh, I was AD back when we did the conversion, we did curdle, and so we had this process of having to like incrementally add curve 25519 everywhere across the ITF stack. And it was just this giant effort of like crossing out like P256 and writing 25519. And so not having to do that would be very nice if we wanted to say, say add post quantum. Next slide. So here's like a concrete example um, that just shows how much like redundancy we've managed to create. Uh, here's like the client hello, the straight up TLS 1.3 client hello. So the first field is the protocol version, which now we've abandoned because we negotiate in supported versions. The second field is the random value, which is, as I said, 32 octets long. The third field is the session ID, which, by the way, we've abandoned because we now we do PSK. Um, the, th the, um, the fourth field is cipher suites. Um, you'll notice that that has a two byte length field and can allow you to have 65,000 bytes worth of cipher suites. Now, we haven't defined 65,000, uh, sorry, 32,000 cipher suites. And I can't imagine any sensible person wanting to advertise that many. So, there seems to be a fair amount of extra slack here that you don't need. Um, then we have compression methods. Have I mentioned we removed compression? Um, and then finally we have extensions. Um, and again, the extensions can be up to 65 kilobytes long, which like is pretty long. And there are like lots of reasons to believe you might only need like you know, a couple hundred bytes of extensions. Uh, you know, typical client hellos range in their sort of 200 to 300 byte range for this area. Christian. Uh, lo looking at your example, I am a bit puzzled that you think of restoring the transcript <laughs> because if you remove the legacy session ID, which is effectively a random number, I mean, your transcript is going to be somewhat affected, right? Yes. You had, so this you would have to, you'd have to not do legacy mode for this. But remember, remember, that, remember that unless you're doing compat mode, that's an empty string anyway. One advantage of, recover, of, of reconstructing the, the entire original TLS 3.3 is that that makes it the, the existing proofs trivially uh, applicable because you could act like you're actually sending the full thing, even though you're sending much smaller. Yeah, that's the intuition that Karthik gave us. Um, so next slide. So this is what you can do if you're like trying a little bit, um, and really only a little bit. Um, so you say, well, look, the protocol version will cut it down to one byte because we don't have a zillion versions. The random will shrink by half because we don't really need 32 bytes. Again, we don't need a lot of cipher suites. We'll make them one byte long. Then we remove all the things that we didn't need. Um, the version of string becomes shorter. The, um, and then we take cipher suites and we have a variant length um, encoding for the length. And so you don't need to burn up to us extra octet on length. And oh, by the way, oh, can you go back one slide? Um, um, I forgot to mention, the extensions field, you'll notice, has its own length field that attaches to how long the vector is, even though the extensions takes up the entire remainder of the message. It's so like simple subtraction will tell you how long the extensions field is. Um, so once again, you have extra slack. Next. So that, hence, you say basically the extensions field now is the remainder of the message. So if you take this treatment and you like apply it to TLS as a whole, you get actually a pretty substantial amount of reduction in message size. Um, so this is like strategy one. Um, strategy two, next slide. Um, if you're willing to like really go crazy and like have like, you know, here is like a, you know, like a say three or four octet profile that describes exactly all the cryptographic parameters, you can do really well. And you can have like the initial byte contain all of the crypto variables, which is to say the random and the Diffie-Hellman key. Um, 
that zero was like, I don't know what we're doing at zero. Like, I'm not aware of any circumstances in which zero would be an acceptable value for a different home and key. Um, but in any case, um, so you can really shrink things down if you try hard. Um, next slide. So um, I regret that I didn't have like the original versions, but you just have to trust me that these numbers here are like much smaller than the number you started with. Um, and um, so you can do a pretty good job. Next slide. So um, this is like preliminary work, um, hence informational. Um, there are another ob ob another obvious places to do optimization. Um, we're working with uh, um, Karthi Bhargavans and other people to like basically be able to see, see what we have to do to make sure we have enough isomorphism the proofs actually carry over, because that's the whole point of the exercise. Um, I see Jonathan has some thoughts on that. Um, we're still trying to decide whether we want to follow the compression strategy, which seems like more compact. Um, um, and also, do we want to expand the transcript? Though I think the conversations I've had this week are making me lean very much towards transcript re-expansion. Adam. Uh, Adam Angley. So you presented your, your two options, but they're not mutually exclusive, right? You're going to be doing both. Yes. yes. In fact, one of the things you might do with a transcript compression is do those reductions. Yes. So, so you, cool. Um, the, the numbers you had on the benefits seem kind of small, right? Is this worthwhile? Like, like what is the, the motive for like stripping off a few tens or 20 bytes? Um, basically, so um, primarily these IoT use cases where basically they're incredibly small packet, packet sizes and, we're, and they're trying to get within like, between the, they're trying to get inside of like three packets instead of like five or six because the, these credit stop and wait protocols. But on the previous slide, I mean, the benefits are, you know, 10 bytes. Oh. No, sorry, sorry. These, this, is, this, is a, this is not a good slide because it doesn't show you where I started. Ah, okay. So a typical TLS client hello is more like, you know, more like 150 bytes kind of thing. Okay. So, yes, thank you. Sorry. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, for 10 bytes, I wouldn't do it either. Ben Schwartz. Uh, I just would like to suggest benchmarking this against uh, plain old compression, like maybe broadly with a with a tuned static dictionary. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, and also, you might even want to consider putting that on top of this. You could do both. I'm lost. I think it's about it's about that here. Um, you and just a clarification question in your example. You said client hello, but are you applying the same technique to? DLS ciphertext records and things like that. Um, yeah, the draft has a, has, a, has a whole thing for all these things, yeah. Um, there's still plenty of places to turn the crank, but yeah. Uh, Roberto Payon, I expect this might be redundant, but just to make absolutely sure. The intention here is to show isomorphism, as you say in the slide, right? And then to provide whatever arbitrary transformations uh, during that demonstration. So <clears throat> you could, for instance, <clears throat> Apologies. You could, for instance, use a single byte and have a bit in the byte to say the presence of any of these fields and then interpret it. You could do protobus, whatever. That, that is the intent, correct? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I mean, the, the ultimate objective is that you should be able to take any new extension to TLS and it's just go to convert directly over so that you get it for free when you want to do in this compact mode. That's the like ultimate objective. Uh, so, Ben Kadek, I. Saw so in Jabber, but I didn't bring my laptop up uh, just to check. This is still assuming like in order of reliable transport. I'm sorry, but I just can't hear you at all. This is still assuming in order of reliable transport. At yes. Least right now. Yeah. Um, though you would, of course, like you could obviously have a CDTLS as well. Right. Right. Yeah, that was what I figured. But yeah, the, the there's actually um, the vast majority of the overhead of the TLS handshake, of course, is in the TLS handshake itself, not in the DTLS extensions. But those are also fairly bloated, and so there's places to remove things as well. Yeah, uh, and just a different point with my own hat. Um, you know, if we think about this sort of as a, a TLS four, you know, one octet version, uh, then that's sort of just like non non backwards compatible, and we can you know, do all the stuff the way that would make sense without this historical legacy. So you know, that kind of makes some sense for for new applications. Uh, my name is Mr. for this plus. Uh, my question somehow related to previous. Is there a well? Uh, is it a completely new protocol incompatible with TLS 1.3, or can we do it somehow negotiable? Uh, whether the compact encoding or full encoding is used, so the CTLS clients can uh, talk to full 1.3. 
their last service? Yeah, there, there are a couple of angles there. I think one angle, obviously, would be to have, uh, you know, to, to have a like non-CTLS client hello followed yeah, by the server sending you CTLS. Another angle would be, um, and this is the one Karthik and I talked about, is to have sort of a translating device who only gets the, who doesn't get any of the ache keying material, but only gets the, the um, only gets the uh, AAD keying material, and that can do the expansion internally. So we looked at a bunch of options. Well, the probably the encoding itself can help. For example, if you put some magic value in, I don't know, uh, version field, that will tell that it is compact encoding. Yeah. So no translated device is needed. And so yep. it's, okay. Thank you. All right, so we got to cut the line, and let's keep it uh, I guess succinct, please. It's Thank AGL. You. I think is next. So I, I think you basically just said this, but if you want to keep yourself honest and convince yourself that this is a security irrelevant transform, implement it as untrusted shims, like on either side. That's in fact the, the implementation that you have is does is, is that. Okay. Yeah. So, I, so the numbers on the slide are from an implementation we did in Mint, which is implemented in exactly that way. It's there's a compression layer interposed between the handshake and the, the transport. If, if you do that, I think you have very good confidence that you haven't broken the security. Uh, Gary, my name is Qualcomm. You mentioned the latest version of the document, uh, uh, predetermined cipher suites as a uh, potential compression candidate. Um, do you have any thoughts as to what a uh, what a server would be expected to do if a client tries to actually negotiate a, pre negotiate with a predetermined cipher suite and the server does not know what that client's cipher suite is? Would it be dropping back? To uh, to uh, to a TLS DTLS handshake, or would it? Go? I think in that case it would fail. It would fail. I case. think so. Yeah. Um, we'll Richard may have some other thoughts, but I think that you you can only that you get the ma I mean the maximum compression you get is if like basically you have prearrangement. Yeah, I mean it's like the usual comp compression trade off. Like the more you pre-negotiate, the better compression you get. And uh, in, in this experiment that we did, we kind of turned the compression dial all the way to, to nail everything down, and see how far we down we can get it. I expect, you know, when we look at, um, you know, the, the, the comparables in ad hoc, there's like a little bit of negotiation in there. I think they, they have like a couple of cipher suites they can negotiate. And so I think as, as this develops and we have some discussion, I, I think this will go on in the Lake Working Group. But uh, as we have the discussion, some of that will be added in, but probably in you know, using some of these, um, you know, optimized encodings that, that Ecker mentioned to do a, whatever little bit of negotiation we need to, to make this work. Um. Do you mind if I ask another question? No, I think we should need to take it to the list. We've got some other okay, presentations. Okay. So. I'll be around after this if people want to talk. Hello, I'm Douglas Deville from the University of Waterloo, and I want to talk about uh, our draft on uh, design for hybrid key exchange in TLS 1.3. Next slide. So just as some background, um, there's been a variety of interest in using multiple key exchange algorithms in the handshake uh, as part of a transition to post quantum crypto and a variety of internet drafts uh, and implementations over the past few years. Uh, the idea to focus on key exchange rather than authentication is that uh, we're concerned that quantum computers could retroactively decrypt, but they can't retroactively impersonate parties. Uh, so the goal here is to develop a framework for using multiple algorithms uh, simultaneously. Next slide. Uh, one thing we're not trying to do is pick a particular post-quantum algorithm. We'll leave that to the NIST uh, post-quantum standardization process. Next slide. Uh, so at uh, the last IETF meeting, Chris presented on our behalf uh, the first draft, which contained a menu of design options on several design aspects. So how to negotiate which algorithms uh, and combinations should be used, how many algorithms can actually be combined, just two or more than two, uh, how to transmit the public key shares, um, and how to combine the secrets. The feedback we got from the working group was to avoid changes to the key schedule and uh, to try to simplify the menu of options in down to a couple of uh, uh, candidates. Next slide. So that's what we've done in the draft today. There is still the menu of design options, just so that's uh, kind of there for reference. Uh, we've got two candidate instantiations, which I'll talk through today. Um, the first uh, option uh, kind of directly negotiates each algorithm and separates the key shares. The second one, kind of follows what some of the implementations have been doing, uh, having code points for each defined combination. Uh, we also added a new KDF that was suggested uh, by uh, someone uh, in the mailing list. Next slide. 
So in the first instantiation, uh, we're kind of taking a uh, proper approach where everything is uh, done separately. So this follows an earlier draft by William White and others. Uh, the algorithms are negotiated uh, individually. So there are new named groups called hybrid marker zero, hybrid marker one, which don't actually mean anything in themselves. They're just pointers into a hybrid extension uh, where each marker is mapped onto the groups or key exchange methods that are meant to comprise that. Um, so each party can suggest as many combinations as they like, um, and uh, they're, they're indicated with these hybrid markers. Uh, and we can allow uh, you know, multiple algorithms. We've put a maximum of 10, but there's no reason that you can you couldn't have more than that. Next slide. So once uh, those have been uh, listed in the negotiation, we have to convey multiple key shares, uh, one for each algorithm. So in this approach, uh, we use the existing list of client key shares, uh, send one key share per algorithm, and so we don't require any new data structures, um, this, at least in the client hello. Uh, the server hello as it stands doesn't allow for uh, multiple key shares to be transmitted. So we have to kind of pack that in. And so the way we've put that in the document as it is, is to have a, a data structure encoded inside of the existing key share server hello uh, that basically concatenates these key shares. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, then we have to combine the shared secrets. So once the key exchange has been done, we have uh, the cryptographic keys. Um, and in the approach that we've got here on the slide, uh, these key shares are concatenated, fed into a key KDF, and then the output is put into the TLS 1.3 key schedule in the place of the existing Diffie-Hellman key share. Um, so concatenate KDF and then use it uh, as it is now. Okay, so that's the first candidate. On uh, the next slide, there's the second candidate. So this follows more what some of the implementations uh, have been doing. Uh, and this is a simpler approach from an implementation perspective. Um, you define new code points for each combination that you want to consider. So you can see we've just extended the named group uh, enum here to list uh, new combinations. So P256 with post-quantum algorithm one, whatever it ends up being, P256 with post-quantum algorithm two, and so on. Uh, and there's no internal structure to these code points. It's just uh, a, a new code point. Um, and then on the next slide, uh, to convey the key shares, then we just uh, convey the concatenated public keys for each of these new code points. So this really requires no changes to the uh, structure of negotiation or any of the negotiation logic. Everything is just a new key exchange method. Uh, next slide. Um, so to compare these, uh, the first instantiation, we have new negotiation logic and a new extension to convey these, uh, the list of algorithms. Um, but it doesn't require any change in how the key shares are conveyed, or it doesn't require multiple uh, groups to be defined for each combination. Whereas in candidate instantiation two, there's no change in negotiation logic or protocol logic, but you have this combinatorial explosion of named groups, and you might have to send duplicate key shares. So if you want to advertise P256 with algorithm one and P256 with algorithm two, you have to send two P256 shares. So those are kind of the trade-offs between these two instantiations. Next slide. So we'd like some feedback on how to proceed, um, either of these options being more uh, appealing, and then <coughs> what the procedure should be for a document like this. Um, hey, so. thanks for uh, doing great a great presentation there. We have 10 minutes for discussion. Jonathan Hoyland, Cloudflare. Um, so obviously, as someone who did one of the formal analysis, it, analyses, I'm very against changes to the key schedule. Um, I think, Actually, your first approach could be wired into the key schedule in a sort of standardized way. And given the other things that we want to do with the key schedule, we should just first work on standardizing how to inject new keys into TLS. OK, so we have a few options in the draft. Um, I've, I've, yeah, I've been yeah. reading. I've been discussing it with uh, Chris. Yeah, OK, happy to talk more. Uh, Adam Langley, uh, option number two. Um, it's not worth all that complexity to say 32 bytes, don't mess with the key schedule. Uh, we've already shipped it, works great. Okay. Yeah, Ben Kaduk. So, I mean, in terms of the trade off, I, mean, I know Adam already told us what to do, but you know, it's sort of a question of if you have a pretty good idea that everybody is going to be doing the same sorts of things, same sorts of algorithm combinations, then it's, it's pretty clear. If it's like totally out there and you're gonna be trying all sorts of random combinations, that's when you really wanna be doing it independently. It's basically the same question as, as what a TLS ciphers would means. 
And we took some of that out for TLS 1.3. Right, thanks. Yeah, I don't think it's clear at this point how many algorithms there will be coming out of NIST, whether it'll be two or five. They haven't given indications yet. Um, so that may affect the decision going forward. Watson? Watson, uh, Cloudflare? I think uh, we are not going to have a large number of algorithms that are being combined. Most of the time, it's going to be two P two fifty six or, or curve two fifty five nineteen combined with some post quantum algorithm, and there's only going to be sort of two algorithms being combined. So I think that motivates being the second option uh, for how you do the combination. You just declare a hybrid, hybrid um, cipher suite. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, um, Martin Thompson. Uh, I'm going to speak for candidate two as well. And option two, I don't think I think that's been implied in the discussion that you got here, um, but I want to say that explicitly. Um, one of the things that you kept saying throughout the presentation that irritated me a little bit was you kept saying concatenation, which is not necessarily injective. So we want to make sure that's that's crisp in people's minds, um, because that's kind of important if we talk about things that aren't simply fixed sequences of octets. Now I think most of the things that we operate on use that as both inputs and outputs, but we, we need to be very clear on that point. So, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, for the key share, we've definitely like explicit, uh, got a data structure encoding. For the shared secrets right now, we're just doing actual concatenation, um, but with a proviso that this doesn't make sense if they're not a fixed length. Marco, NCSE. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for bringing this uh, draft to the working group. I found it uh, a useful reference. Uh, I'd like to speak in favor of option one here. I think it's good to have the informational document that, that describes the, the, the different ways of doing the, these hybrids and the, the pros and cons of each. Um, so I think that that's useful. I can see scope for both of these actually, but I think you know, doing one in the first place uh, would be good. Uh, I, I'd also like to speak in favor of uh, trying to keep uh, options in there for having the, the hybrid designs to be as general as possible. So possibly incorporating more than uh, two uh, algorithms uh, into the hybrid and uh, the possibility of uh, combining uh, classical algorithms as well as just post quantum algorithms in there. Thank you. Um, people have been, okay, people have been assuming that NIST will only approve two algorithms or three algorithms, that may be the case. However, each algorithm of, that they've been under discussion have multiple parameter sets and we are likely to want each parameter set to be treated separately. Instead of only having three algorithms, we might have a total of 12 parameter, algorithm parameter set combinations and that should need to be kept in mind. I think Watson said what I was going to say. I, I was just enjoying standing up. Yeah, so Martin Thompson, in, in response to, to Scott there, I think this is um, something that we would ask, I, I would want us to ask the CFRG to address, because I don't want to have uh, an, this explosion of parameter sets. I want one option, preferably, maybe two. And um, that may be two different options, and there may be different sets of options for different use cases, but ideally it's one, maybe two, for the use for any individual use case. Does that make sense? Yes, NIST always underspecifies these things, and where the ITF has not then finished the specification, bad things have occurred. Right, right, and I mean, PSS is an example of that, and it's pretty hard to use, yes. and that's got like two parameters. Uh, yeah, yeah. When it finally happens, we'll have to nail down all the parameters. But even so, I'm not worried about a combinatorial explosion because the first right. element of this tuple is always X25519. Because who is doing modern stuff and still using P256? Yeah, I agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Hi, so this is, as mentioned, on the topic of, uh, uh, of ESNI split mode. Next slide. So I, I'm going to use the term load balancer here. This is maybe an idiosyncratic usage of the term, but uh, the load balancer is this thing in the middle that's doing the splitting or the forwarding or the proxying. I'm gonna call it a load balancer. Uh, I am particularly interested in a kind of load balancer that I call an SNI proxy. 
So that uh, traditionally has been something that inspects the SNI and then forwards to a backend that is determined by its SN, uh, by the connection's SNI. And the nice thing about SNI proxies is that they don't terminate TLS. So they're, in a sense, they're the highest point in the stack that doesn't terminate TLS. It's the most information you can get while maintaining end-to-end -to -end TLS. Next slide. So the, the motivation for this is split mode ESNI. And I'm going to draw a distinction here that I don't think is clear yet in the ESNI draft between partial and full split mode. So the, the key difference here is that uh, in the ESNI draft, you must know the ESNI private key in order to reply and formulate a working server hello. Yeah. But uh, if you have a variety of backends and they all have this private key, then you have a widely shared private key. So for example, if you are operating a large commercial service, your adversary could simply sign up for your commercial service, learn the ESNI private key, and then use it to decrypt SNI on the wire. So for that reason, we would ideally like to have full split mode where backends do not have the ESNI private key. But under the current specification, that, uh, that means that they can't answer in the server hello. Next slide. Hi, Stephen Farrell. So, so partial split mode is kind of the new term you're introducing here, right? Is there a real? Is that a real thing that we'd ever want, or is it just the, like the ESNI draft uses the word split mode to describe both of these things in different places within the draft? Personally, I never considered that middle line as something that anybody would want. And okay. if it's if it's covered by the description, then maybe the description is not sufficiently precise. Maybe this is going to be a rat hole, but I'm also surprised by this. I thought that the way it written the specification allowed was, was designed around full split mode. But it's, of course, possible I made a mistake. So the, uh, I am, if I remember the text correctly, the, the current ESNI draft says that you can implement split mode either using the uh, encrypted Z hack or by sharing, uh, just oh. sh pre-sharing the ESNI it's private key. possible to say that. That was dumb if I did. Yeah. Ben Kedek, it sounds like everybody only wants full split mode, so maybe we should just make that change and, and okay. not worry about the distinction. Next slide. So there's, this is not the only case where somebody has had a proxy in the middle of the connection and wants to send some information along with the connection to the backend. And the, the major case where this is done already is in the proxy protocol, uh, which is almost entirely used just to inform the backend of the true client IP address, which is no longer visible to the backend. But it can, and uh, it, it has been extended to incorporate lots of other information, especially actually when you are terminating TLS at the load balancer, it's widely implemented and it's completely unencrypted and insecure. Uh, so while we're in the business of trying to forward some secure information between a load balancer and a backend, maybe it would be nice to uh, set up a clear path forward for people who want to do that in a more secure way. Next slide. So the proposed architecture here, which is completely lifted from the ESNI draft, is to simply use a, a PSK that's prearranged somehow between the load balancer and the backend to encrypt some proxy data, which is basically just a bag of data. And that includes things you need in order to answer the ESNI. Uh, if you're doing ESNI, it includes the client IP address if you would have otherwise used the insecure proxy protocol. Uh, and the back end just does some symmetric crypto to decrypt and use that info. So this, uh, this is what the draft says currently. And in response to the draft, there was uh, some very thoughtful and detailed analysis on the list and a couple of other architectures were proposed. Next slide. So one proposal, which I believe was made by Stephen Farrell. So this, this is my attempt to capture a proposal by Stephen Farrell is to simply do TLS in TLS. So rather than uh, specifically encrypting the proxy data, um, open a new TLS section between the load balancer and the backend, write the proxy data into that stream, and then write the client hello and, and everything uh, that follows from the client. And similarly, the downstream responses from the server would be in TLS, would be decrypted and forwarded to the client. So 
this is uh, ha is is very clear. I think it's the the cryptographic properties are nice and clear, but um, it is computationally intensive. We're spending a lot of time encrypting ciphertext again. Um, Jonathan Hoyland Clark there. Uh, in putting a TLS session inside a TLS session does not give you clear cryptographic properties. Um, you have to bind them together using exporter keys on the outer one and then some magic on the inner one if you want to actually get the security properties you think you're getting. Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot more complicated than you might think. Christian Wittemar. Uh, ben, there is similar work going on in the quick working group on the load balancer protocol. I don't know whether you're following that. There is a draft in the quick working group related to load balancing. Uh, I think eventually we are going to have to square these two concepts. Yeah. I think that the load balancer draft in the quick working group uh, so far, I think, addresses largely separate issues, mostly yeah. related to um, connection IDs and regression. Yeah, that is correct, but I mean, yeah, that's related. Uh, oh, okay. Like, uh, to to pay on. Uh, there was some theoretical research, I, I don't know how else to say this, uh, that was done before QUIC was uh, announced to the IETF um, about client, or sorry, intermediary assisted packet loss stuff, which has many very similar properties, and I suspect that you should look that up. Okay. Uh, I will try to look at that. Uh, next slide. So the, another alternative architecture, um, this is my attempt to capture a, uh, a proposal described by Martin Thompson, oh. uh, is to use an, uh, an Oracle to decrypt the ESNI. Um, in the simplest implementation, that would mean that the connection is forwarded to the backend completely unmodified, and then the backend contacts an Oracle and asks it to decrypt the ESNI information. Um, this is nice and clear, uh, but it's probably too slow to implement in this literal way. You'd really want what I would call a push oracle. You could imagine implementing this with HTTP2 push, uh, but this becomes a really complicated and potentially flaky setup. Uh, so, next slide. The my questions are, should we be pursuing this uh, at the ITF in TLS, um, especially given that we're, we've also been talking about what's appropriate to go inside the ESNI draft? In my view, there is an interoperability question here. There, there is essentially existing work in the form of the proxy protocol for communication on this link that's not secure. and. I think it's worth trying to do better, uh, and I think that the use case in ESNI is important and worth trying to serve. Uh, and if people do think that there's work worth doing here, then there's an architectural question, um, you know, which direction should we be going here before we really hammer out all the details? Martin Thompson. I'm not going to get up to talk about the details of the protocol, but um, I think we also have a third question, which is an organizational one, which is where work like this happens. If, if we have work in the quick working group that is addressing a very similar use case, uh, it seems to me like this straddles this working group and that one. It would not surprise me if there were other people that had similar, <laughs> similar uses. Um, Maybe, maybe this is uh, something that needs to go to SEC dispatch or dispatch or um, I don't know. Gen area. Let's put it in gen area. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure Alyssa would love you. Yeah, I, I'm generally enthusiastic about this. Uh, I, I don't I haven't thought about the details that carefully, so I'm not willing to opine on them yet. Uh, Martin's probably right that we do need to. Uh, think about where this ought to go. Um, perhaps uh, I see an area directors, that's very helpful, but perhaps some of the considerations ought to be 
what the security prop how much is the security protocol versus like an application information protocol. Um, my suspicion is it's actually a security protocol based partly on Jonathan's comments, but other things like that, that if we don't think about the security aspects, we may be sad people, but um, it may also be the case that the, 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 the question, the security questions are well isolated and can be, uh, you know, can be ha handled separately. The, I, I just, you know, have a secure transport and then like figure out the binding mechanics and then just stop. So I, I don't know yet, but it might be useful to work out some of the other cases of what kinds of information you might want to carry in this protocol. And then we'd have some sense of where we were. I, I do know that there were a couple of IAB members in Mike line, but yeah, this seems like a question the, the IAB and the ISG should think about you know, where to do this work so we don't duplicate efforts. Uh, Jonathan Hoyt and Clapper again. Um, I do think that there's like been three drafts and there are six currently adopted drafts that all do basically a very similar thing from a theory level in terms of like binding stuff into TLS. So maybe as a working group item, we should start considering how instead of doing exporter keys, we do some sort of importer keys and not directly, but like there are a bunch of drafts that try and do this. We should just solve it. All right, Stephen. Yeah, so I think we should standardize the solution. It should be, you know, done. Uh, we shouldn't do something stupid, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that would ever happen. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't yet know what architecture I'd recommend. I think I'd need to know more. Eric Niger and Akamai. Um, yeah, this topic has come up a few times. I remember even, I think, in the first HTTP workshop, um, this came up as a big topic because the current proxy protocol, or the current proxy protocol isn't real, with air quotes, isn't really standardized. And there are plenty of cases where vendors will ask for implementation of it, but, in, but the lack of security here does not make it appropriate in a bunch of cases where it's being used. Um, but I think finding something that is efficient enough that's probably closer to your first one is going to be important because if we just do this, but totally change the shape of it. No one's going it may be that that it'll be hard to to switch implementations away from the um, from some of these current insecure use cases. Okay, thanks. I think the outcome here is to talk to the ADs and figure out if there's some grander plan that we can figure out what to do with it. Right? Thanks. Yeah, back to the plan of coordinating between the ISG and IV. We'll put it on the agenda to chat on Friday. <clears throat> so um, Eric Nygren talking about, I'm going to be talking about a proposed HTTPS service record. Um, next slide. The topic of this conversation or the kind of the motivation for this came out of a number of conversations that have been going on. It came out of the ESNI keys discussion where as we're <clears throat> looking at having this ESNI record, which would be a new record for clients to go look up, a lot of complexity around how to handle things like multi-CDN and proxies and other use cases kept showing up in it. Um, and ESNI trying to solve that as a, well, what ends up being kind of a more holistic problem solely in the context of ESNI started creating both either a complexity risk, but also a composability risk of how when some of these next issues start coming up, are we gonna have to try to cram those into that ESNI record? Or maybe we should take a step back and look at some more things more generally. Um, one comment on these slides is that that these slides are from before we actually I presented an HTTP BIST, and there have been a number of conversations since then. And I think one of the big open questions that um, that's come up is is how much it makes sense to go and generalize some of this beyond just the HTTPS use case. And I'll talk a little more about that later. But some of the top things, at least on the HTTPS um, front, that are um, that there's a desire to address right now in parallel is the encrypted SNI keys that we've been talking about here, uh, transport protocol, and how do clients start using HTTP3 um, and quick without having to go through a redirect through um, the um, a legacy TCP protocol is another one that is another one that comes up, and how do we kind of bootstrap into that via DNS? Especially if there are better um, end up being better privacy properties if you can go straight um, straight to quick rather than having to go th go through TCP. Um, indicating origin default uh, that an origin defaults to HTTPS so that we can just have a that when 
someone puts a, a bear name into a browser and types in example.com, being able to have a clear way to say, hey, this goes straight to HTTPS um, without having to do that redirect through clear text HTTP and having a more secure default. Um, uh, next slide. <clears throat> so the, the um, approach here is to look at things that is having a single new record that um, browsers can resolve in parallel with the A and um, the clients can resolve in parallel with A and, um, um, in parallel with A and the A and quad A. In particular, this is not really browser specific, despite what this slide says. Um, the but also look for something that's extensive that is is has reasonably good usability from an operational perspective and has some performance optimization baked into it, So, which we've spent a lot of time on the yes and I key side of how do we make this so that doing this extra lookup minimizes the performance impact, um, impact and overhead number of round trips, um, but also having it be extensible enough so that when we want to handle the next case beside beyond the few that have been identified that we can add this in in a reasonable fashion. Um, but also something that is compelling enough for, to convince clients to implement it because when talking with the DNS op group over the years, and they have a specific issue around a um, the zone apex problem, and what and which they build SR, the SRV record to, to address a number of years back. And there's some frustration on the DNS side of, hey, we created SRV, we kind of meant it to be for the HTTP use case. Client never really started using it, um, and it, <clears throat> so something that can break this chicken and the egg of of okay, we're going to introduce a new record, but convince both enough clients to implement it, but enough server operators and and DNS providers to, to implement it may help um, get past some of the standoff here. Um, but also gives, and I think another goal is look at, at is there a way to, to especially as clients start using um, Doe or other things, is there a way to have more more secure defaults we can move to just help close out some of these, these kind of um, insecure by default straight to HTTP and then having to upgrade up style use cases. Next slide. So the general approach here, um, has is you can look at it as being somewhat similar to an extensible SRV. It's that, and a reminder here is that within DNS, if you get a bunch of if you get a bunch of individual RR sets back, there's no way to necessarily associate them. So if you if you do a resolution for a a ESNI record and you do a re resolution for an A record and a quad A record. There's no um, way to determine that those actually came from the same source. In a multi-CDN case, some of those may have come from one CDN, the others may have come from the other CDN. So if fundamentally what you need to do is have something where you have a single resource record that kind of binds a number of attributes together. If you look at even SRV, SRV does this by saying, saying for this given um, name that I'm trying to look up, here is a, a um, kind of this, this, the actual server name and the port number for that and associate that together because you may have different, because you may have some server names which implement some ports and other server names that implement other ports. So HTTPS service basically takes that and extends that and, and allows additional attributes to start getting associated onto that. Um, in the particular case for TLS, ESNI keys becomes one of those, but you could, we could potentially see other things being associated on there in the future. Next slide. The I won't go into great detail in um, in this here. This is probably more. Some of these details are being talked about in more detail in in the DNS and DNS op at HTTP BIS. Um, there are two there are two forms for this. I won't go into great detail on this form. But next slide. Um, the alternative services form is the one that the um, ESNI keys would would come into play for the HTTPS use case. There's a Within it, you have a um, service domain, um, um, a service name that in indicates what the name is. So, for example, svc3.example.net would say that when you're, if you go to svc3. If you want to, if you, um, the top line here mean is with the, be for example, that if you're trying to get to svc.example.net, you should um, use svc3.example.net over Quick to um, to port 8003 and Quick with a particular set of ESNI keys. Um, or you could go and use svc2.example.net over HTTP2 on a different port with potentially a, diff a different set of ESNI keys. Next slide. Um, so one of the questions that's come up on list is, as well as in conversations, is what's the relationship of this to, to the um, 
ESNI, the ESNI record that was proposed. And I think there's, there's a third example that I don't, or a third scenario that's not covered here. So kind of a, a fundamental, I think there's a, it makes sense to separate out the ESNI key format itself um, from the way we're distributing it through DNS and look like um, some of the, the most recent draft versions at least pull some of the DNS extensions out of that, that record. And then the question becomes, what do we do about the DNS records here? Um, I, I see there being a few different options here, one of which is to say that you have um, per, a per application protocol binding that, says, that descri would describe how you would want to use um, ESNI keys for a given protocol. So for HTTPS, we could say, go use the HTTPS service record, and then there could be a generic, um, either simpler binding that says, hey, go use the ESNI record. Another option here is there's been some interest of saying, okay, HTTPS service seems useful for other use cases. Maybe it should be generalized to not just be HTTPS specific, um, in which case you could have that, um, that more generic HTTPS, um, or that more generic um, DNS record use case could cover the ESNI um, case as well and incorporate support for ESNI keys and therefore el potentially eliminate the need to have a separate ESNI record. Next slide. Um, next, in terms of next steps, um, when I wrote these slides, I thought that HTTP BIS, what we're gonna be talking about this afternoon, might be the best home for adoption for this. Um, after talking in, into DNS and DNS op and talking to the, um, some of the chairs, it may actually be that DNS op is a better home for that and the DNS op and HTTP BIS chairs are, are talking on that front. Um, there's a, um, a place in GitHub where we've been working on this until we get it adopted in a particular place. Um, there's a, on the name server side, there's, on the DNS side, there's been interest in this, especially because it solves some other problems <coughs> they've been interested in. Um, so there's a bind nine private type implementation that got um, done by Mark Andrews, and in the hackathon, someone did an unbound implementation. Uh, Alessandro Guidini, Cloudflare. Um, if I understand this correctly, um, the client would have to first resolve the HTTP SVC and then do another resolution for the alternative name. The, and there's, there's a bunch of optimizations proposed in the draft. So, the, so the, if following the optimizations, the client would do resolutions of the A, Quad A, and HTTPS SVC in parallel with each other. And, if thing, and similar to the ES, some of the cases in ESNI, if things go right, um, you, once, you get all, once you get those records back, you shouldn't have to do any more in the cases where they all point to the same thing and there's not a multi-CDN use case showing up. Um, another one of the kind of open issues slash questions has been, does it make sense to put, the, to kind of follow the path of, of the ESNI record and inline or have a way to inline the A and Quad A record straight into the HTTPS service record. There are a bunch of down, there are a bunch of upsides and downsides for that. For example, um, not inlining, not inlining them and having them be separate makes some of the um, proxy use cases like proxy connect work a lot more cleanly because as you separate some of that out. Um, on the other hand, inlining it helps for performance and inlining it also may reduce some of the, the, the complexity of client implementations. Right, uh, there, there was um, a proposal for yes and I for the multi-CDN problem. And, um, well, there were two proposals. One was embedding the, the addresses in the yes and I record. And the other one was like advertising a separate name or whatever. And the reason the second one wasn't picked was that it would require two resolutions and that wasn't like a good idea. And if, if you do, if you stru if you structure, and there's some recommendations in the draft. If you stru if you structure things right, um, you do have um, you. And we t I think there was some discussion on this, and some experimentation on this on the SNI side. You can get cases where where if you do those in parallel, the you can get a re you may be able to get a reasonable enough hit rate that you that it's not that bad performance wise. We got about ten minutes left, folks. Thanks for presenting this. Um, I'm certainly more than happy to outsource the work of DNS hacking to DNS people as long as it actually meets our requirements. Um, so I think, you know, the, uh, as Alessandro um, indicated, 
the reason we selected the current design was because we felt like that was going to have the highest probability of getting you an answer in the time frame that you needed to have to be efficient. If it turns out that that assumptions are incorrect, certainly we could look at a different thing. Um, seems like the question of whether inlining is possible, certainly, there's, as you say, there's no reason this can't contain inlining, so it's perfectly compatible with that, if that's the way you decide to go. I don't really understand quite the relationship between TLS, which would be the first consumer of this, and DNS app or whatever would be the um, you know ultimate producers of it. Um, and I want to make sure that that relationship was well specified and that we didn't end up backed up way behind something that was very complicated, um, so, um, and, or not, sorry, not complicated, uh, that was going to take a very long time in another working group because we certainly want to deploy ESNI relatively rapidly. So uh, those would be my concerns, but if we can manage an efficient process on both sides, certainly having something which was not designed by TLS people to be shut in the DNS would be a superior outcome. Hi, Eric, thanks for presenting this. Uh, I'm a little bit unclear what specific to HTTPS this, this record has. It seems that it applies to TLS generally. Um, and I think that is um, the, that's probably been the biggest side effect of feedback on this so far is that it makes sense to generalize this. And I think it, the, the exact question will be, how does it make sense? Like, what is the right form of generalization of this? And, but I, and I think if my, if this got adopted within a work, and this might, that was one of the reasons why DNSOP may be more, a more attractive place to general, to, to adopt this is that it would be that we could go and look at what is the right way to generalize it there such that for the, um, the that we don't have the, some, that we can minimize the performance impacts, deal with a bunch of these corner cases that were coming up in the ESNI design, but do it in a, a way that covers a bunch of the other cases and then there may, in addition, be a may have value of being a kind of subsequent patch or thing on it, saying for the HTTPS use case, here are some additional ways to use this, possibly as a, as one general one HTTPS R name and one or one HTTPS specific um, RR type and one more generic RR type that have roughly the same form, um, roughly the same for, or have the same format, but have some additional semantics layered on for HTTPS. I guess more specifically, my answer is which part of this is only HTTPS? It seems that it's only the alt SVC. The things that are HTTPS specific in this yeah. are the, the that we use the alt SVC formatting for it, um, and that the treating the that um, that not using the underscore labels for the HTTPS 443 scheme, so that you so that that you can just. Um, um, to deal with some of the wildcard use cases for it, um, as well uh, as the the um, H HSTS style pr um, proposed default behavior. Okay, thanks, uh, Adam Langley. So I think you you started from sort of an SRV record, and that's why it looked to me that the sort of redirect host is mandatory in this textual format. But why, why do we need that? Why do we need to name, say, the, the CDN? Like I, I, so I'm assuming you'll stuff the IP addresses in there because that makes sense. Um, but I, I don't understand why it's not just a blob of key values. Um, the, and, um, so the, in particular, you do need to get the, you do need to get the IP addresses um, or some way of tying to something that'll give you IP addresses or have the IP addresses directly in there because yes. to handle them, to handle things like the multi CDN use case. Um, well, well, you don't know because let's say that uh, I've just got one server, um, like you can look up its A record and you can look up its HTTPS SRV record, which gives you a bunch of other information. Um, like I don't need one. I don't need this redirect name. And like I wouldn't need IP addresses, but obviously if you've got multiple CDNs and sticking IPs makes in that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but I don't understand why this host name field is mandatory in this record value. And what in the what would so one thing that host name field can be in the in the draft is it can just be a dot which says it's the same as the record. Oh. Okay. So it's already optional, it's just textually prioritized. Yeah, there's a way to, there's basically a way to say use a specific um, form in this, in uh, that case. I would textually demote it, but okay, thank you. Tommy Polly, Apple. Um, so 
Thank you for sharing this. I know we've already talked, <laughs> but um, I'm definitely in the camp of people who says this should be a generic thing. Um, I think that does make more sense. So just plus one to all of that. Um, yeah, and I, I think just with regards to how much is in line versus somewhere else, maybe one way of kind of breaking that up, because I think there are a lot of other things I would like to see that maybe aren't appropriate to actually fit in line. Um, I'd like to get those somewhere else, but maybe we could have a split of things that are shareable between multiple names, multiple records that is external. And that actually mitigates some of the lookup cost, right? So mm -hmm. if I had a CDN deployment that had, so let's say I want, I want to actually be able to use this for like Doe server discovery or saying like, these are the right things to do for that. And if those are all sharing properties between names, then that's something that I can go fetch kind of a generic CDN configuration from some name that you allowed me to look up through this. But if you have a specific key for just that particular name, then that stays in line. Mm -hmm. So I think this mechanism is a really great way to allow for this extensible vocabulary going forward. Right, and I think to some of the why do we have names rather than IP addresses yeah. also goes to that because the yes. other, like an example of that case would be if you have, um, if you want to advertise both H2 and um, and HTTP 1.1 and and quick for a set of I, A and quad A ad records, you may like combinatorically you otherwise end up with, um, and I think you, um, you end up with a potentially um, huge set of things. And having that indirect level of abstraction helps address that. And I think like for the ESI key itself, one of the questions is that do you inline a base 64 of that, or do you have a a name reference, or do you allow Either case, um, do allow either case because I think there's a, yeah. that trade-off between the perf the performance impact of doing indirection versus message size, um, especially in the face of of, ca of caching. Right, and then if you have like totally unique ESNI keys for every name, then have them inline. But if you have a way to derive them generically, put it elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo Kuligi, uh, plus one to making this more generic. I think that sort of argues against putting in HDB bis, but uh, could be either in DNSOP or TLS. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to point out um, maybe that, you know, perhaps everyone's aware of this already, but like the SNI key is a property of the IP address, not of the name. So it does seem more sort of straightforward that the IP address be in here uh, because otherwise you basically, when you do a parallel implementation, you do an A and a quad A and then a service record lookup. But if you're unlucky and the quad A for, you get the quad A for a different CDN, then you're like, oh, wait, you have to basically walk the intermediate C name chain of the of the of the HTTPS service record, and then do another lookup for a quad A for the name that you had. And so that the CDN operator is good, or you get lucky, it's efficient. But if not, and it's very complicated to implement on the client. So uh, plus one to putting IP addresses in there, I guess. Mike Bishop, Akamai, just making the observation that this is this is an outgrowth from having the alt service DNS record, um, which is why it's in the same repo. And that alt service is applicable or could be applicable to other things than HTTPS, but hasn't been defined for that. And so this is a step in that direction and could eventually be generalized, but I think we'd have to figure out what it means to have an alt service record for something that is not an HTTP origin. Mm -hmm. Dan York, Internet Society, but not speaking for Internet Society. So to Lorenzo and Adam's case, I'm somebody who wants the, the domain name in there because I'm from the DNS side and I want to use this for the CNAME at Apex fix to be able to point from foo.com over to a CDN in some case. Uh, so that's where I'm looking for that. My question for you, though, Eric, and thank you for presenting this work in these places and doing all this. this will require client implementation across all the clients for this to work correctly, correct? Correct. Okay. I think that's what, and similar to the, um, ES, the ESNI record would also presumably need the same thing. Okay. And I've, I've seen a number of people doing prominent clients standing up here, but are you the chair, the uh, co-chairs, are you not the co-chairs, the authors, are you involved with talking to those about getting this into their thinking? We've been having some convers we've been having conversations with a number of with some uh, certainly some browser clients haven't yet had the as many conversations with non-browser clients 
Um, like, and one, one con, I think the, in one, at least one conversation, it was clear that, that when you, st when you start having a fairly rich, um, stack that provides an abstraction, like an HTTP abstraction or a top style abstraction, that you can fit this sort of thing into that abstraction well. Um, what becomes trickier and may also be trickier with, with, um, ESNI as well is, with the ESNI record is when you start having a, um, much closer to the metal style set of abstractions and you're still dealing with things like get, um, get DNS by name and, and connect and such that it does add a lot more complexity to that, that class of client. Okay. I mean, and so I would, I hope other people who are here who have clients that could consume this will be talking to you. My one concern just looking at it is that you are, it is capable of solving a good number of different use cases. And with that comes the complexity of implementation that I think we just, there is, I guess, a question in my mind around the scope of it and how, how much, how many of those use cases we really try to solve with this piece here. But right. thank and you I for doing this work. And I think that's also a balance on how general to make it, because the more general it starts becoming, as we've seen with many things here, the, the, the more risk you start having of having it be way too complicated. Um, on the client side, one, one reason why I'm somewhat less concerned about the, the, um, the, some of the client complexity is, is for enough of these use cases, for enough of these cases that want it, um, having robust client libraries that people can use that handle things like TLS cert verification well and um, DNS and connection management well is probably is going to become increasingly important because a lot of the people who do who do the the hey I'm just going to use some of the underlying primitives directly without really understanding them well have there seems to be an increasing risk as those primitives start to get more and more complex that that they won't do some of the they won't understand the caveats and for example, won't do same TLS cert, um, server cert ver verification. We're out of time, basically. I should shut up. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Adam. Um, thank everyone for showing up. Um, we, we had some different uh, presentation requirements this time, so please let us know what you thought about the presentations this time. Just TLS chairs at IETF.org. Thanks. Blue sheets. Blue sheets. Where are the blue sheets? Um, I, I will have to